Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition, so you will not grow weary and lose heart. you. That's our tactic to wake you up. And uh, still good to have you here. Hey, listen, kids are back at school. Football starts this weekend. And we're in church. It doesn't get better than that. I don't know. At least for me. All right. The sound team's all screwed up now. But anyway, um, if you want to live a life that pleases God, it starts by living by faith. Nothing that you do means anything unless it comes from a place of faith. Living by faith in the Son of God and Jesus Christ and finding eternal life in him, believing that God alone is the truth, and living with a faith that puts into practice all the things you believe, all the things you choose to do, all the actions you take, all comes from faith. If you don't have faith, it's impossible to please God. You can do a lot of nice things, but they mean nothing without faith. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we've spent the past 11 weeks covering Hebrews chapter 11. We've looked at 19 very specific people or people groups to look to them to draw inspiration on how to live by faith. And we saw that sometimes they lived by faith and they saw some partial answers. Sometimes they didn't see answers. Many times it cost them something, cost them comfort, cost them certainty. In some cases, it cost them their lives. But in all cases, every one of them would say it's worth it. And I hope this has helped build your faith. Now today, I want to wrap up the series by asking you an important question. Because we can learn a lot about faith, and we can say, this guy, we've got faith from him, we learned faith from that one. And that's all wonderful. But here's an important question. How do you build a faith that lasts? How do you build a faith that lasts? that lasts, a faith that can survive tough times, a faith that can uh, stay strong in good times. By the way, you know what? It's hard to keep your faith when times are tough. Can I tell you when it's harder? It's harder to keep your faith when times are good. For every nine people that can handle adversity through faith, there's only one that can handle prosperity. That's why uh, you could be afflicted with affluence. It could be the greatest curse in your life to be blessed with material things because then you're fat, dumb, and happy and you think you don't need Jesus. So how do you build a faith that carries you through a difficult divorce, an unfair job firing, the death of a family member at a very early age, an accident that's left you in pain or poor health, or some financial crisis that leaves you barely able to pay bills, or conversely, to have so much success that you stop depending on God and you think you're your own source. Or so busy that you treat God, treat church, treat Bible reading, treat serving, all those things as a nice option if you've got time. Today I want to help you build a faith that helps you through adversity and prosperity. One that can easily carry you through any situation. And we find it in Hebrews chapter 12. And so we wrapped up Hebrews 11, but in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, we're going to learn how to build a faith that lasts. Now, let me say this about the Bible and about Bible verses, and that's this. The chapters and the verses in the Bible 
are not inspired. The Bible is inspired by God. The Bible is inerrant in its original autographs. The chapters and verses are not. God did not say, put chapter 12 here. Right? It's one letter. Paul didn't write chapter 12. So, so sometimes when you see a new chapter, you think that's a new idea. And sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. In my understanding, I think chapter 12 is kind of the conclusion, the wrap up to 11. And, and the author continues that. So we're going to look at that. Open to Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, and take out your notes. And before we dive in, let me just say this. Um, ministry and being a pastor and and the staff can tell you this because all the staff feel this way. The, one of the greatest joys of being a pastor is to see people embrace faith in Jesus Christ, become a Christian, grow in their faith, and remain in the faith. I look around you and I see hundreds of you. I know you came to faith in Christ here. I know you've been here for a long time and it's super, super cool. To me, that's as good as it gets. And um, I understand what the Apostle John said in 1 John. He would call um, uh, the people he helped become Christians or the younger Christians, he called them my children. And, and you're not my biological children, but I feel like some of you are kind of like spiritual children to me, and it, it means so much. But also, one of the most heartbreaking things to observe as a pastor is people who say they embrace Christ, said they embrace Christ, made some kind of indication they embrace Christ, maybe even got baptized, and now they're walking away from the faith. They're not here on Sundays. They're not at any church on Sundays. They've rejected their faith. <laughs> one of the scariest questions, and uh, I was thinking about it this week, I go, yeah, you know, I haven't seen, I haven't seen this one, I haven't seen that. Well, one of the scariest questions, I go to the staff, and go, I haven't seen so-and-so, right? And some of the answers I've heard, man, I can't even go public with them. They're just... <laughs> they hurt. It's so, so sad to hear. They didn't have a faith that lasts. By the way, Jesus warned us that there would be many people that don't have a faith that lasts. That's the parable of the sower and the seeds. So here's my plea. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. Make sure you have a faith that lasts. It's got to be genuine. And once you know it's genuine... Then you have to understand how to keep it strong and make it last. That's what I want to talk to you about. So Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, I want to read it again. You saw it up on the video. I want to read it again. And then what I'm going to do is, is draw out some principles from it. So let's read it. Um, in fact, let's read it together. Ready? You got your notes or on the screen? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose hope. So from that passage, I get three important principles, three powerful truths that will help you build a faith that endures in hard times. The first involves people you spend time with. That's critical. The second involves decisions you make every day. That's critical. The third involves the focus of your life, what you will focus on every day. So if you want to build a faith that lasts, here's the first thing you have to do. Enlist the encouragement of faithful people. Enlist the encouragement of faithful people. I can tell a lot. I could not know you, but if I knew the people you spent time with, I can tell you a lot about who you are. You always become like the people you give your best time to. You need to spend time with people who are not Christians. You need to. That's not an option. You should spend time with people who are not Christians. Your best time, however, your best time should be with people who are strong Christians, 
Not mealy mouth Christians, not talk a big game, but true Christians. Because here's the truth. There, in life, there is no impact without contact. Let me say it again. There is no impact without contact. So you need to be with people who are growing in the faith so they can impact you. And how do they impact you? Through contact, some form of contact. And that's what I see in, at the beginning of Hebrews 12. Look at what it says. It says, therefore, as a result of all that we've said in Hebrews 11, that's where I see the continuation, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, great cloud, meaning a great collection of people who showed us how to live by faith, those 19 people or people groups, great cloud of witnesses, witnesses. By the way, the, the, the Greek word for witness is, is the same word we get in English, our word for martyr. So uh, we have a great cloud of witnesses, a great cloud of martyrs, a great cr crowd of people who suffered for their faith. And yet their faith lasts. When you can suffer through your faith like these people did, and your faith lasts, man, I want to learn from you. <laughs> I want to learn. Tell me what you got, bro, because I want to learn from you. It's so important. If we want to build a faith that lasts through the hard times, we need to draw from and enlist help and encouragement from faithful people. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, two ways. You have mentors from a distance and you have mentors up close. Here's the first one. Mentors from a distance. You need to learn and remember the lessons we learned from the heroes in Hebrews 11. By the way, whenever you read the Bible, there are heroes all over. They don't have to be mentioned in Hebrews 11. But every time you read the Bible, you look at Daniel, you go, wow, man, that's my hero. What can I learn from Daniel? Wow, Joseph, that's my hero. What can I learn from Joseph, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a practical assignment. You want to make this series last. Here's what I suggest you do. Go through all the characters that we went through in Hebrews 11 and maybe put a pause on your regular quiet time if you're reading through the Bible. Put a pause on it and say, I'm going to go to the first. First, I'm going to read about Abel. I'm going to read the Hebrews passage. I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 4 and read about Abel. And then Enoch. I'm going to go to Genesis 5 and read about Enoch. And then uh, who was next? Uh, Noah. I'm going to read about Noah in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. And, and then, so in other words, you read about what Hebrews says, then you go back to the Genesis account or the Exodus account or the Joshua account, and you read their stories, man, it's like, like biographical studies. So 19 biographical studies, it'll encourage and build up your faith. Those are mentors from a distance. The second way is more mentors up close, and that's to spend your best time with people who are modern day 2024 heroes of faith for you. Again, it's impact by kind of find people who are living for Jesus Christ and make friends with them. Take them out to lunch, have coffee together, and say, I admire you, I, I respect you, I, I want to get to know you, I want to learn how to be a better Christian from you. It, it's, it's so rich. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 talks about this. It says, and let us consider. In other words, find ways to consider how we may spur one another on. Spur one another on. Motivate. I mean, what is a spur? If you're riding a horse, you just, you, I, I don't know why you kick them. like to get them going. Give them a spur. And you want to spur one. Not you want to spur, you know, go to the cafe, get a fork and gouge somebody's eyes out. I'm not talking about that. But just get around people and just encourage and, and motivate each other towards love and good deeds, which are what? The expressions of faith, love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. There is no impact without contact. You gotta be around people. I believe in mentors from a distance. I believe in admiring the mentors of the Bible, of course. But there is a reason why God created human beings to be together. To spur one another toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. In other words, some people just don't want to get together. They don't go to church. They go to church. The average Christian before COVID came to church three out of eight times. 
So eight, in eight, eight given Sundays, the average Christian was at church three times. That's pathetic. Guess what? It's less now, post-COVID. It's less. But encouraging one another, that's why we get together every week. And all the more as you see the capital D day approaching. The purpose of meeting together uh, each Sunday is not just to worship. It's not just for Bible teaching. It's not just for serving others. It's not just for talking and stuff and having coffee. Great coffee, by the way, in our Waves Cafe. But (laughs) it's to be together so that we can encourage each other. Encourage each other. And then it says, as the day approaches, what day is he talking about? Like Thursday? Like <laughs> What day? Well, first of all, the day is not a 24-hour period. You know, sometimes you use the word day and you go, like, like somebody gets mad at somebody, yeah, my day will come. You know, it doesn't mean my 24-hour period. It means a period of time. Especially you see the day approaching. So what does that mean? The more you see this day approaching the more we're going to need encouragement. And that day is fast approaching because that day in the Bible is called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. A lot of people don't know what the day of the Lord is. I'll tell you exactly what the day of the Lord is. It's a 1,007-year period. How about that? Wait, can you get a little more specific? It's a period of 1,007 years. Why? The Bible says that the day of the Lord is a great and terrible day. The first seven years are the terrible part. And so the first seven years of the day of the Lord begin right after the rapture of the church. And we're going to, by the way, we're going to cover this a lot more in detail. In three weeks, we're starting a brand new series called What in the World is Happening? And we're going to tell you what in the world is happening in America, in Israel, in the world, and in the end. But this, after the rapture of the church, when every true Christian, not everybody who goes to church, not everybody who talks a big game, true Christian is taken up, there will be seven years of hell on earth. That's the terrible part of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And after the seven-year tribulation, Jesus comes back with the church. At the rapture, he comes for the church. At the second coming, he comes back with the church, and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. That's the great part of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And Paul... and. Um, uh, the Hebrews author says, as you see that day approaching, how many know we're close? I mean, tick, 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 boom. It, we're so close. You don't even know how close we are. I don't even know how close we are. Nobody knows. But all the signs, and we're going to talk about that in the series to come, are there. When you see that day approaching, encourage one another. That's the point. Be together. And the day is coming really, really soon. I I tell you right now, (laughs) there is a war. Do you know there's a civil war in our country? And it's not, it's between right and wrong. And um, only God knows how it's going to turn out. But the discouragement of our world will unravel you at the seams unless you have a source of encouragement. That's what we're here for, to encourage one another. It starts on Sundays, but it continues in small groups. Midweek will be starting in a few weeks. That'll be exciting. A great series planned for midweek. Lots of things to do. So here's my first takeaway. To build an enduring faith, realize that we need people and people need us. We need people and people need us. People are needed for us to be encouraged in our faith. People are looking to us to encourage their faith. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Like, we like people, but they drive us nuts. How many know what I'm talking about? Like, you love people, but they drive you nuts. Reminds me of a porcupine on a cold night. You know what a porcupine on a cold night does? Cold night, bunch of por- You know what they do? They huddle up together. That's what me and Sue did at the Red Wings game last night, huddling up. Snuggle up my sweetie. Aw. It was so great. We were freezing. Thank God at the top of the six it rained, and we said, oh, better leave. And rain delay. <laughs> we're freezing. Well, you know what porcupines do? They get together. You know what happens when they get together? Their quills pop up. And when their quills pop up, they go, get away from me. But then they're cold. So they come back together. 
and the quills pop up. And they do this little dance. And one person says, you know what a porcupine? Porcupines realize they need each other, but yet they needle each other. They need each other, but yet they need. How many know that's what relationships are all about? You got to put up with the needling to get what you need and to give what you need. The worst thing you could do to a person is, in prison is what? Break rocks, make license. Whoever makes the New York State license plates, they need to go back to school. Them things are falling up, flaking everywhere. No, the worst thing you do, put them in solitary confinement. <laughs> Even God said to Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. I understand the context. It's, it's the institution of marriage and the creation of marriage. But that was, one, that was the primary remedy for man's loneliness, but it was also he had children. That was a blessing of God. God said, be fruitful and multiply. There's a, there's a principle there that, that people are not designed to be alone. So we need encouragement. I was thinking about all the new changes in my life since I became a Christian. I became a new Christian, didn't know what I was doing. Thank God I had a friend named Matt who built into my face, helped me understand how to read the Bible. Uh, moved to Florida, graduated from RIT, electrical engineering degree, moved to Florida. I didn't know anybody, not a soul. Went to a church, and I, there was this couple, John and Susan Fenlison. They said, man, we just, you know, just want to say hi. And they became our friends. They, they, we went with them uh, uh, to Alabama for Thanksgiving, and um, just became great friends. Then we moved to a new city, moved uh, from South Florida to Central Florida, Palm Bay, and a senior pastor just mentored me and built into me, started my journey into ministry. Small group encouraged Sue and I. We still see these people when we go to Florida sometimes. And then we moved to, again to a new city, Dallas. And Bill and Adrian Smith, a um, uh, black couple. Man, it was so cool. We were at um, new student orientation, and they had new student wives orientation. And, and, and at the student orientation, I see Bill Smith. He's from Buffalo. I'm from Rochester. I go, man, Bill. Can you believe this? I can't wait to tell our wives. You know what happened? Sue and Adrian Smith meet, and they go, wow, we can't wait to tell our husbands. And we're like, how bad? How? And God brought us together. You know what the greatest thing was? I really understood more clearly what it's like to be, be, to be black in America. Bill's one of my best friends, and he's my best friend in seminary. We encourage each other. We struggle through Hebrew together. I mean, it's just amazing things. He's going to have his 30th anniversary. We're going to have our 30th anniversary, too. We'll be there in a couple weeks. Then we moved, and, and Andy McQuitty at Irving Bible Church, who we're, we're still staying in touch, still in friends. He supported our church. Man, he encouraged me. Then we moved to a new city in Rochester. So many pastors encouraged me. By the way, so many pastors tried to discourage me, too. It doesn't matter. I can go on and on. But let me just say this. I would never be who I am today unless I enlisted the faithful help of other people. Same's true for you. You need faithful people, and people need you because you're faithful. Do you have these people in your life? This is one of the reasons why you come here. By the way, this is why we have 6,500 square feet of atrium space. It's to create an environment where you can be together, encourage each other. Are you being encouraged? by them to trust God more? Are you encouraging somebody to trust God more? If you want a faith that lasts, that's what you gotta do. Second thing I get from the passage is, this is a big one. If you wanna build a faith that lasts, you have to eliminate everything that's going to hinder your progress. If you wanna build a faith that endures, you gotta identify everything that's gonna distract you and get in your way of growing and you gotta get rid of it, excise it. Hebrews 12, 1b says, so let us throw off, throw it off, get rid of it, chuck it. Everything that hinders, that slows us down, and the sin that so easily entangles, that stops us. Hindering slows us down in our faith, and then uh, entangling stops us. When you're entangled, you ever see a fly in a spider web? It's stuck. And everything in life is either helping you grow in faith, pursue it. Maintaining faith, keep it up. Or hindering your faith, chuck it, get rid of it. The life unexamined is the life not worth living. You need to constantly examine your life 
and start asking this question. Do I need to get rid of that in my life? You know, a lot of times we, what do I need to do? <laughs> what do I need to do? And that's an important question. I'm going to tell you another important question. What do I need to stop doing? Who do I need to stop being with? It's important. There are some things holding you back in your faith, and you need to have the guts to kick it out. There are some people that are holding you back in your faith, and you still spend good time with them. Throw it off. There are some behaviors, some things that you and I do that are hurting our faith. Get rid of it. Maybe there are certain words we say that are not helping us. There are certain environments we're in, certain habits we're, we're consistent, certain fears that we live in. Get rid of it. You have to confidently and constantly look at your life and say, is this helping my faith or not? And you have to get rid of the things that aren't. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Colossians 3, 5 to 7. Look at what he says. He says, put to death. That's the same idea as throw off. Put to death. Get rid of it. Kill it. Therefore, whatever, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. What's that? That's the old you. That's the you before you became a Christian. That's the you before you had faith. What's going to keep you from growing in faith? The old you. The old you. Well, I can't, you know, the old you is like an old pair of shoes with the hole at the bottom. Man, them jokers are comfortable. But step in a puddle and you go, shoot, shouldn't have worn these things. And you need to get rid of it. Everything that belongs to your old person Sexual immorality is the first. Big. Impurity. Lust. Evil desires. Greed. Oh my goodness, these are all sneaky. Sneaky. You think you have victory and then five seconds later you don't. Which is idolatry? Now is the whole thing idolatry or is greed idolatry? I don't know. I know greed's idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Where? On you. Don't do it. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. God expects us to put our old life of sin to death so we can keep it from hindering our life of faith today. You know, when I became a Christian, my life changed quickly in some ways, gradually in other ways. <laughs> in other ways, I'm still, it's still a fight. And some things came quickly. I smoke pot every day. I've chronicled that many times, you know. And um, I drank to get drunk. I, I wasn't an alcoholic, but whenever I was at a bar or something, I'd get smashed or whatever. And, uh, man, some of that stuff, I mean, the pot quit instantly drinking, you know, a month or two in. And some came in time. Some, the ones, the things that came in time, a lot of my friends, and it was a tension because I loved them, but they wanted, they wanted to keep getting me to smoke pot, chase skirts, get drunk, and do all the stuff. And at some point, I had to say, no, like, not doing that. I'm not doing that. And I love you. Now, if they listen to me, you know, I didn't know how to share the gospel, by the way. I was, so, I was such a confrontation. I'd be like, um, um. that pretty much got rid of a lot of friends right there. Just me. I didn't know how to share my faith kindly. I was just like a maniac. And... I had, to, I, had, I had to tell, I just had to stop hanging out with friends. I really did. By the way, I still do it today. Every couple of years, I got to go, you know what? I can't be with that guy. By the way, Christians, they say they're Christians. I had a Christian friend one time, we're playing golf. I said, let's, let's share our faith with this guy. I told him, let's share our faith with this guy. Because we were in a threesome, me and him. And the whole time, he kept berating me, putting me down, undermining Reminding me, we left, we left the Greystone golf course that day. I said, this friendship is over. It's over. And he was, I mean, I've been friends with him for 20 years. It's over. There's so many things I've had to give up. 
We built a house. You say, it's just a house, Vince. Just a, we built our first house in Florida. I remember not even two years, we, we moved to Texas. I remember driving by the house crying. You know, but I'm not crying. It's just, it's not, I don't know. It's raining. I, don't, I mean, I started the church, you know, made less than 60, per, just, just under 60% of what I was making as an engineer. Try to build a core group for two or three years, you know. I didn't have time to play around. Let's play golf. Let's play. I don't have time to play golf. I mean, I played a little. But I'll tell you, sometimes the cost was a lot. But every time, the cost was worth it because my faith was built up. God provided. God encouraged me. God, I saw sides of God I couldn't believe. Here's the second takeaway. To build an enduring faith, realize this. To go up, you have to give up. To go up, you have to give up. Sometimes if you want to go up with God, you got to give up stuff. And sometimes it's obvious the stuff you got to give up. There are relationships that bring you down. I understand that. But I'll say this too. There are some good things in your life you need to give up. Sometimes you need to give up the good to get the great. Sometimes you got to give up the nice to get the necessary. So a lot of times it's obvious Sometimes we just still don't have the courage. It's obvious you got to give up certain relationships, certain things, certain habits. It's obvious. And that's big. But I'll tell you, if you want to get deeper with the Lord, you got, you got, to, give your, you got, to, you, you got to give up things that are nice for things that are phenomenal. Sometimes the good is the enemy of the great. What do you need to give up in your life right now? What do you need to give up? Are there people in your life you know they don't build you up? And all right, they're not Christians, spend time with them, but they're not listening to you when you share the gospel. What things do you need to give up? You know, like to me, like I I don't care what kind of car I drive. I, I really value a house. Oftentimes I say, would I still love Jesus if God burned up my house? I'd like to think I would. How about time? What time do you need to give up? How about sacrifices? What things do you need to give up? Do it. I'm telling you, I, I, I've been on both sides. I've given things up, and I've watched God bring me up. And I've not given things up. And I've, and I've wondered, man, if I had given that up, what would God have done? Give it up. Third and final thing. So the first thing, you want to build a faith that lasts, enlist the encouragement of faithful people, mentors from a distance, mentors up close. Second, eliminate everything that hinders your progress. Bad, sinful things, even good things that are hindering your achieving great things. And then third, this is, this is the heart of the passage, engage every trial you face focused on Jesus Christ's example. No matter what trial you've gone through or going through, you've never had it as hard as Jesus Christ. He did all he did to offer us eternal life. You know, one of the the, the greatest tragedy in the world is that you'll never find anybody who loves you like Jesus Christ. You'll never find anybody who sacrificed for you like Jesus Christ. And 80, 85%, maybe 90% of this world will say, no thanks, no thanks, no, no, no. My boyfriend loves me more than Jesus. Sure he does. Oh, no, 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 no. This other religion, uh, I don't know what to say. But not, not only did he sacrifice to offer us eternal life. That is the priority, by the way. Jesus Christ also sacrificed, Peter tells us this, Jesus Christ also sacrificed to provide for us an example to live by. You can read about that in Peter. And the author of Hebrews begins the last part of the passage, the end of verse one all the way to verse three. He says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. So he, he has in mind the Ithmius games, the, 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 the Greek games that were around in the amphitheater. And, and he, he pictures life as a race. He does this um, in many places. Um, he pictures life as a race. 
And, 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 he, and he pictures it in the amphitheater, like the old, um, the old games of old, the predecessor to the Olympics of today. And, and we're in an amphitheater. By the way, who's seated in the amphitheater? The, Hebrew, the Hebrews' 11 heroes. They're all cheering us on. They're not going USA. They're going you, you, you. They're cheering you on. Not, not that they're in heaven looking at us, but they're cheering us on in the sense of giving us the example they did. Because I don't think people in heaven give a rip about what's going on down here. They're focused on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. You know, when you run a race, you fix your eyes on the end. You fix your eyes on the tape. You fix your eyes on the finish. And Jesus is who we fix our eyes on. The pioneer and perfecter of faith. What does that mean? Jesus is the pioneer of faith. He started faith, and he starts our faith. And he's the perfecter of faith. He finished the faith in, in terms of his earthly uh, ministry, and he finishes our faith. By the way, the Bible says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Uh, Philippians 1.6. God will finish the faith work if we are truly Christians. And he says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's stop right there. What did Jesus do? The Bible says he endured the cross. The most torturous driven event in the history of the world at that time was the crucifixion. Tortuous. Before that, Jesus was beaten 39 times with a whip that tore his body to shreds. Most people, not most, a percentage of people who were whipped died. Died. Convulsing. People whipped convulsing and yet couldn't move because many times they had their hands and feet uh, attached to a stump. While a lictor, a professional execution, would bring a whip loaded with bones, metal, and, and stones at the tips of it, wrap around the body, around the rib cage, pull back, and pull off skin. Then it was all night. Then it was six hours of nails in the feet, nails in the hands, slow suffocation, and that's what the Bible means when it says he endured the cross. And then it says it suffered the shame. What's that all about? Well, when you're crucified, it's likely that Jesus was stark naked. And people walk by, <laughs> healed others, can't heal himself. <laughs> I said he's the son of God. Come on down if you're the son of God. Mockery to no end. And of course, the whole purpose of a public crucifixion was so the Roman government could make an example, a shameful example of its victim. The only difference is Jesus Christ did nothing wrong. And that same Jesus Christ said to the people who mocked him the same thing he offers to every human being today, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Don't know what they're doing. That's the, same, the shame he scorned. No one has ever endured suffering like Jesus. So how did he do it? Look at what it says. Scorning the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And notice how it says, for the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? The fact that he knew when he endured the cross, endured the death, and rose from the dead and ascended, he is now seated at the right hand of God. He kept that in mind. He knew the end from the beginning of his trial. So he said, I'll endure my trial because I know what the end is. I'll be back with the Heavenly Father, back in the triunity, the trinity of God, back in heaven where I was always until I incarnated. Of course, he's God, he's everywhere, and it's a mystery, he's finite and he's infinite, finite in his humanity, infinite in his deity at the same time. I don't understand it. And he said, I'll be at the right hand of the Father, so he endured the cross. For the joy set before him. 
And then look what it says. Consider him, consider Jesus Christ, this one who suffered, bore shame. Consider him. But yet he saw being at the right hand of the Father was the end of all of this. He saw the salvation of you and I who are Christians, the salvation of people who are not yet Christians. He saw all of that, and that was the joy that was before him. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We look at Jesus' example. We see how he suffered. And we remember he focused on the reward. The only way I get through times of suffering is this. I remember this. God has a purpose in my pain. God has a purpose in my pain. When people come after me, circumstances frustrate me, my plans don't work, my dreams are shattered, the only way I get through it is when I get sane, get my mind right, and I say this, God has a purpose in this pain. And what is that purpose? Ultimately, to build your faith. Ultimately, to make your faith as strong as steel and pure as gold. That's why Paul said in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. We all want that. But watch this. I also want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know how he suffered so I can identify. I want to know how he suffered by my suffering so I can feel what the Lord suffered in some small way. So here's the third takeaway, and I'll wrap up with this. To build an enduring faith, remember that his sacrifice far outseeds our sacrifice for him. People go like, oh, can't believe God did that to me. I'm done with God. He did it to me. Look at what he did to his son. Look at what he did to his son. He crushed his son. Oh, he hurt me. He doesn't hurt you without a purpose if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, all bets are off. I can't answer it. But if you are, never crushes you to destroy you. He breaks you to remold you to be the best you you can be. The sacrifice Jesus Christ made should build our faith up when we have to make sacrifices for him. No one has ever shown the world this incredible love. So as we end this series, I'll say this. Every series we do is for a purpose. Here's the purpose. My heart The heart of our staff, our elders, our trustees is real simple. It's not hard. We want all of you to have faith in Jesus Christ. And those of you who already do, we want you to have stronger faith. And those of you who have a stronger faith, we want you to have a stronger faith every day. And I end with this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. I love this verse. So simple, we should all memorize it. We live by faith not by sight. Let's pray. Lord God, 12 weeks on faith. Can't think of a more important subject than faith. You said, Lord, in Luke, that when you return, will you find faith on the earth? It's an open question. Will you find faith on the earth? And I want to ask you, will you find faith Will you be found to have faith on the earth? When Jesus comes back or you die, will you have faith? If you're a Christian, you say, I'm a Christian. I have faith. All right, cool. Here's my question. Do you have an ever-increasing faith? It tangles us. And let's remember the model of Jesus Christ. But if you're never going to find a love greater. And if God's Holy Spirit tugging at you, He's saying, now's the time, sister, brother. Now's the time. Come to faith. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Here's how you do it. Say, Jesus Christ, you are God and you're holy. Jesus, I acknowledge I have so much sin in my life and I can't fix it. But when you went to the cross the way the Bible describes and you suffered and took my sin, you forgave me. Come into my life and cleanse me. And if you say that and mean it by faith, Let us know about it. Congratulations. It's the greatest thing. Father, help us not forget this series and help Lakeshore Community Church be loaded with people 
who live by faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, hang in there for just another minute or two. If you made a faith commitment, let us know about it. Online, in person, connect card, online. Click on that. Let us know about it. Prayer, if you need prayer, come right up front. I hope you have a great, great day. Before you leave, we've got a great song to wrap up this whole series and inspire your faith. So stick around for this. Have a great day.